Friends, you know my style. When I, when I sense God doing something, I'm going to make you aware of it. Well, oh my goodness, when we were praying for, for Morgan down here, I could just feel just the, the vibrating presence of God through the prayers. And I got back to my seat, and I'm just still kind of just shaking now. And, um, and I just looked over at Rachel, and I said, did you, did you feel God's presence? Because it was just so overpowering. And she just looked at me and she says, God loves, <laughs> he said, God loves Morgan so much. And God is in the midst of releasing a spirit of revival among Athens. It's going to change our town. And one of the things you're going to notice as he does this is that it's going to, to grip your heart and it will change your heart so that you can actually you can feel what God feels. So that when you hear that God loves someone like Morgan, it just goes so far beyond words because all of a sudden it grabs your soul. It's like, oh my gosh. And it's like heaven meets earth. And so that's where God is taking you in the here and the now. That's what God is opening up into your life because he wants your soul to come alive. It's a gift that he gives to you simply because he is God. And for that... We ought to live with our hands up like this at all times. Thank you, Jesus, because we have nothing to do with it. You know, and it's just simply kindness coming down to land on us and change our lives. Thank you, Stan, for reading that from Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 12. And I just feel led by prayer right now. Would you just join me in prayer? God, I thank you for each person that is here. I thank you, God, for the life change that you intend to make um, in, in me, in them, in all of us, God. And I pray for more. I pray, Jesus, that right now you just take the key from heaven and you unlock each person's soul in the here and the now. I pray that in this moment, God, they would experience you so that, Lord, just like... Um, during a message that was preached about six years ago when Tim Savell heard a word from you, it changed his life, God, and set him on the direction for becoming a pastor. Lord, we each have different directions, callings in life, like Morgan to become a dental hygienist, but different occupations, different things. But it's you, Jesus, that goes in front of us, and it's you, Jesus, that makes the way um, so that there is impact, there is change in the lives of the people around us. And so we give ourselves to that, God. We give ourselves to you, Jesus, and ask, and we say more. What you are doing, more we pray for. All to the Father's glory. In Christ it is done. Amen. And as I'm, as I'm ministering, I'm just getting the sense the Holy Spirit's already working on some of you right now. So just be open. Just be open to what God's doing. Uh, friends, back in April, I shared a, a mission statement that our leaders had worked on for some time. And I, I spent a couple of weeks unpacking what that meant. It was driven by two, two verbs. And you're going to hear this again and again and again. You see it place, place in our newsletter. But the mission of our church is, is to engage. These are the two verbs, engage and equip. One has to do with unbelievers engaging people who don't have a church family, engaging people who have never heard of God, engaging our community with the good news of Jesus, okay, that's for outside. And then for those who start coming and waking up to God, then that's the equipping part. Engage and equip. Equipping believers to become devoted followers of Christ. See, that's what Morgan's family, her parents, her grandparents, and all those through the prayers and the Bible lessons and just everything they poured into her life, um, that's what they have done. They've helped her to become a devoted follower of Jesus. And that's why she stands in front of us and did with such faith is because of all those years of sowing into her life. So I covered our mission statement a couple weeks ago. Today I'm going to cover our vision statement. Now you think mission and vision, they kind of rhyme, you know, in a way, but, but they're different. So a mission statement is something that we seek to do. 
a vision statement is something that we believe God is calling us to see. Here's the change that we are to see around us as a result of carrying out the mission statement of engaging and equipping. Equipping, okay? So um, we believe that God is positioning us to see an unmistakable move of God transforming our communities through redemption, restoration, reconciliation, and revival. And, and Michael, I'm just getting a word from God that you're going to be ministering in the revival. He's preparing you for that. Don't know what that means or looks like, but it's coming. That's God's word to you now, his promise. So the four R's, redemption, restoration, reconciliation, revival. Let me unpack those for us so they, they make sense. Uh, redemption, first of all, Ephesians 1, 7 says this. In him, in fact... Um, let me see, are we tracking here? Yes, thank you very much uh, for that. Thank you, folks, for keeping track of me there. So for redemption, if you will, um, put that up there where it says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And so the scripture says from the Old Testament, God set it up this way, is that he wanted to teach us that the stuff that we do, the commands that we just casually uh, disregard of God, you know, we don't pay attention really to what the Bible says, or we just, we're cherry pickers, we pick the part that we like, we ignore the part that we don't. Um, what that means is, is that God wants you to know every time we kind of turn away from Him is that it, it costs something. It, it, sin is costly. So in the Old Testament, he set up this system in which they had to make sacrifices every time they did something wrong just to get in right standing with God again. Um, it says from Hebrews 9.22, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. So Jesus became the perfect sacrifice for your sins and for mine in order to redeem us, in order to kind of buy us out of the hell we were choosing for ourselves and the separation that we were living in. Because see, when you were born, you were born DOA. You were dead on arrival. You did not know God. You had no way to get to God. And Jesus said, I want to change that for you. And so he came to redeem us. Now, here's what I want you to understand. This message is not being shared around the world. Even in Christian churches that call themselves Christian churches, a different message is being delivered that confuses people and actually leads people away from God. For example, um, if you will put up the next one, uh, Cheryl, uh, there's a sign. This was from a church that's, that's in our area. And um, we saw this about four years ago. And I want you to read this because the message here actually is, is more dangerous than you know. God prefers kind atheists over hateful Christians. Now listen, none of y'all want me to be hateful to you. You know, I don't want you to be hateful to me. That's not a good thing, right? Because we need to have an attitude adjustment if something like that happens. So it's, you know, we don't want to be hateful Christians. But if we, if we do carry hate in us, then that is a sin that's got to be confessed. We come to the cross. We say, Jesus, forgive us, all right? Um, but to say that and for... To get this message out to thousands of people who are driving by a church, God prefers kind atheists over hateful Christians. What that's saying is, is that if you just simply choose to be a nice person, you don't have to honor Jesus. You don't have to believe in God. You just be a, a good person who hands out muffins on the street corner. And you will get God's favor on you, and you are um, living an earth-up life where you are building your own stairway to heaven, that by your own niceness, you get to promote yourself to heaven above people who are hateful Christians. You hear that? That is not what the Bible teaches. That's an earth-up theology rather than a heaven-down truth. Because in that kind of theology, guess what? You don't need to be redeemed. 
you're redeeming yourself. You don't need a Savior to do it for you. So dangerous stuff that's being delivered in messages. So God wants us to understand and get it right that redemption is what we have secured through Jesus Christ. So if you're a Christian, you have been redeemed by Jesus. Jesus gave you faith, faith that you could believe in him, and at that point, you know, he said, okay, you're mine. He purchased you out of a direction toward hell you were going in. Thank you, God, right? I'm so glad that God redeemed me and you as well. Now let's look at the next part, restoration. Here's the second R we're going to tackle. Um, 2 Corinthians 13, 9 says this, For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. So, do you know that God is in the business now of restoring you back to the to the original DNA, the spiritual imprint that you carry of God in your life. See, you are made in the likeness of God. That's why Genesis 1.26 says, let us make humans in our image in our likeness. So God is saying this. God the Father said this one day to God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, and then guess what? They started making us people, all right? And so we are made in God's image. And what that means is to be made in, in His image, in His likeness, is that there are parts of, in us, God things, God attributes. Love, joy, peace, or patience, or kindness. We don't have all nine of them to operate at the highest level. Um, because we have a sin nature that's also in the mix that kind of covers over the likeness of God. So that's why there are times when, you know, you're looking at another Christian and you're thinking, man, I don't see any of God's likeness in them, you know. <laughs> and, I mean, and, and you know what, guess what? They may be thinking the same thing about you, <laughs> okay? So, so, so don't get too cocky about this, all right? And, and, and so you wonder sometimes, well, if we're made in God's likeness in His image, where is it? Well, it's often covered over by our sin nature. It's kind of uh, like this. I describe it in this way. Who's seen the movie Predator? I think it's from the 80s or 90s with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Okay, all right. So let me just tell you real quick. In, in Predator, Predator. Predator is this alien that comes from a different planet. And uh, he's trying to make trophies out of human beings and stalking them down and, you know, and, and taking them, making kills. And so he's after Arnold Schwarzenegger. And um, this alien's really, really big. He's got some Rastafarian hair. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a rough-looking guy. And so the alien is tracking Arnold. Well, Arnold is in, toward the end of the movie, he's like in this lake, and he's crawling out. He's exhausted from how this alien's chasing him. And he just crawls up on this muddy river bank, and he just sits there, and he's just out of gas. And he just knows, okay, this is the end. Well, the alien comes on shore, and the alien's looking around, but the alien does not see Schwarzenegger, who's up against this muddy bank, because the alien doesn't have eyes like you and I do. He can't see in the physical. The way that he detects people in the way that he sees is through these thermal imprints that he sees coming off of a person's body. Body heat, okay? So... When Schwarzenegger is crawling up in this muddy bank, he's completely covered in mud. So his thermal imprint can't be seen. It's completely covered over by the mud. And the alien doesn't see him, doesn't feel the heat, doesn't see the heat, and just simply walks on by. So Arnold's true nature, the way that he normally looked, was covered over. Well, God's nature that he has placed in you, that you were born with, the likeness of God, the image of God, has been covered over by our sin nature, muddied by it. We have mud all over us. And so the cool thing is, is that when you are redeemed and you are made a Christian, God doesn't stop there. He says, oh, watch how good it's going to get what I have for you. And he begins restoring you. He begins wiping the mud off of your life of sin so that you can live more fully into the complete person that God has always intended you to become, carrying the likeness of God to the world 
around. And that's a beautiful thing. So, James, what I want to ask you to do is come up. I'm asking my older son to come up and share uh, with us. This is why... Um, and think, what James is going to talk about here is about restoration, about steps, faith steps that we take so that the image of God is fully recovered in your life so that you are taken to a place in faith where Jesus is pulling you to like back the way that it was before Adam or, or when Adam was made before Adam ever sinned. Um, to recover that, but even go beyond that because Adam did not have Jesus inside of him. He was made by Jesus, but he did not carry the very presence of Jesus in his life, but you do. So God's taking to even more, all right? So James explained to us how um, God's desire, how we can say yes to, to what he wants to do in our lives and free us from this sin nature that dominates us. What kind of faith steps can we take to say yes to God's direction? Three, which says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. So thinking about uh, just restoration, um, I was praying, and the stuff that I, I felt like um, God was speaking is, one, uh, just the culture attacks. The culture that we live in today really just uh, attacks us. Um, and wants to define our truth and wants to uh, keep us apart from the Lord ultimately is culture's goal. And so when I was praying about this, I felt like the Lord was just leading me to talk about the spiritual disciplines um, that he's laid out in word, in his word. Um, and so the first of that being prayer. So whenever we have prayer, whenever we spend time praying uh, to God, we're just spending time in that personal relationship with him. We're allowing him to speak into our own lives. Um, and we're just engaging in that personal relationship, allowing the creator to, who made us to just speak into our life and love on us. And whenever we uh, really step into that and we listen to him and just understand that he's a God who is loving, who's willing to send his son to die on the cross for us, um, that gives us so much freedom to just step into that, into that relationship with him. Um, and uh, when we have freedom to step into to that relationship, that really allows us to um, release our control of what we feel like we need to control in our lives and to just have freedom from anxiety uh, through that prayer and just knowing that he's a loving God that we can fully step into freedom with and realizing that he's going to accept us wherever we're at and love us um, and then walk us through that restoration process. The second uh, um, spiritual discipline uh, is reading scripture, is just co uh, continuously going back to the word of God and allowing him to uh, define the truth. He's the one who created, you know, the whole world. He's the one who created us and just allow him to define the truth and not allowing the world or culture to define um, what we see or uh, what we believe in our own lives. And uh, the third of that being, uh, the third spiritual discipline being uh, service. Whenever we go out into the world and whenever we serve others, um, we're focusing on, uh, you know, pouring out what the Lord has given us into other people and uh, we're having a perspective shift of uh, thinking about, you know, like ourselves and what's going on with us to pouring out and seeing, you know, what work is the Lord doing in our community and with other people around us, um, which is very important. Uh, the fourth being uh, meditation. Um, to just take time to be alone and process with God, process what's going on in your life, uh, and to apply the, the prayer and to apply this, uh, just the word that he's been speaking. How do I apply these things to my life um, and allow the Lord to, to move and really work in those things? And then the last one being worship. Whenever we worship, um, we just get to engage and we get to say, God, like, thank you for sending your son. Thank you for uh, being a God who loves me, who cares. Um, and that shifts our uh, perspective from, uh, you know, uh, the world is going to say, uh, without God, there is no hope. And so whenever we worship it, it allows us to restore that hopefulness and that thanksgiving and uh, gives us a new perspective and allows us to be hopeful and just uh, walk through life with Christ in that way. And so all of this stuff, um, all of these spiritual disciplines are just healthy ways that the Lord uh, gives us to live life with Him and to just connect with Him. And whenever we do these things, we're actually engaging in spiritual warfare is what that is. Is 
we're fighting against those spirits that want us to be anxious, that want us to not have hope, to want to tear us away from God. Yeah. And um, whenever we do those things, these are the avenue that uh, God uses to restore us, to uh, jump in and see, God, you know, what are you doing in our lives? What are you doing in uh, the lives of people around us? Um, so, yeah, all this stuff is really awesome, and uh, this is what the Lord has for us, I think, uh, just going forward. Um, he wants us to be restored to Him and have that relationship. Okay. Thank you, James. So what's interesting is, is that um, God wants you to be a student of what He's doing in the here and the now. So last week when I was sharing, um, just talking in the message about how we don't have to tolerate anxiety and how we, we can live better and beyond it so it doesn't control us. Um, James came up and he showed me his um, Sunday school lesson that he was supposed to teach last week, but he didn't get a chance to teach it. And I saw in there, it's like, oh my goodness, these are like steps for restoration, and this is what I'll be preaching about, I mean, not only from last week, but also this week. And so it was God's way of just saying, okay, Look how I'm orchestrating this message, you know, from people in the congregation. And so when I saw that, I was like, okay, James, uh, I, Jesus is going to put you up here next week. <laughs> you, you've got responsibility to come up and teach this then, because I just saw clearly that God's hand was in that, because it matched the, the idea of restoration and restoring us from all the stuff on earth that clings to us, that really keeps us down, and discourages us and keeps us from living in the full presence of God Almighty, you know, in all the purposes He has for us. So, um, restoration, redemption, reconciliation. I'm just going to touch on this a little bit. You'll see the, the verse up there on the screen from Ephesians 2.13. But now, this is what God is singing over your life. But now, in Christ Jesus, my son, Father says, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Do you know why once a month we will make a practice of having communion here? And always, if you'll notice, before we take communion, notice this. We never take it without first confessing our sins. The reason is, is that sin, the things we do fracture our walk with God and they start peeling our hearts away from God and so in that um, separation we need to, God calls us by grace to come back to him and so then we say, okay God I confess what I've done wrong just fully bring me back into relationship with you, that's reconciliation, we're being re reconciled every time you meet Jesus at the cross and you confess something that was wrong, y'all, that's a touchdown for the day. I mean, that is a place where you get freedom and you, you're like fully reconciled with God again, you know, and it's, and it's healthy and it's good. So let me move on to the next one. Though. There's a lot I can say about reconciliation, uh, but let's move on to revival. So we're looking forward to seeing, here's what we're after here, our vision statement. We believe God is, is putting us in a spot for us to see an unmistakable move of God transforming our communities through redemption, restoration, reconciliation, and revival. So Psalm 85, 6 says this, Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? And Jesus' answer to you right now from heaven is absolutely. Yeah. Your responsibility and mine is, is to live into it, okay? That's our part. Like sunflowers see the sun up in the, up in the sky, and then they start bending toward it. See, we're to bend toward the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And then he begins revival in us. You know, y'all, um, it's amazing what God has done. In, in our nation's history, in so many of the stories we don't even know, um, we don't even know about. We're not even aware of. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude with this when we talk about revival. Back in 1857, this is quite remarkable. This is in the history books. Back in 1857, there was a guy by the name of Jeremiah Lamphere. He was a businessman in New York City. And God put a call on his heart and really challenged him. 
he felt led to walk away from his business as a businessman, uh, which probably was very lucrative and good, but God transitioned him, and now he had a new, a new phase of his life to move into. He walked away from the world of business and stepped into uh, a ministry of becoming a prayer evangelist. Now, you may wonder, what does a prayer evangelist do? Well, a prayer evangelist starts praying for people who don't know Christ to be saved and for the Christians to really start praying for God to send revival upon those who are in the body of Christ. And so he started praying for this, and he, he got all of his business contacts, and he started inviting all these guys. So what his idea was, he said, listen, let's meet at a church, and I want you to do it during your business or, or during your lunch hour. Forget about eating and just come to church, and for an hour we're going to pray for God to start gripping our city and to bring people to repentance so there can be redemption, so then there can be restoration and reconciliation. And so they started praying for that. On September 23rd, 1857, at a church in New York City, Jeremiah Lamphere had this first businessman's prayer meeting during lunch one day. Um, six people joined him, and they prayed. He didn't allow himself to get discouraged, and he just kept inviting more men. Well, the next week, 16 men just stepped out on their lunch hour and started praying at this church. The next week, it was 34. The, within a month, 100 men in their suits. Can you imagine Wall Street brokers doing this? I mean, it just blows the mind. And they're there and they're praying for God to invade their city. Now, here's what's interesting. In about a month later, after this first prayer meeting started in the city, New York City, with six men getting together, the economy, and, and Brooks, you're a, you're a stock trader, so you understand this, um, the economy in New York City crashed. Tens of thousands of people lost their jobs. Well, guess what happened? All of a sudden, people felt motivated to pray because they knew they needed God's help. And so, all of a sudden, this, this church where they were meeting in, it became so full of men who were praying on the business hour that they filled up every single floor of the church. Um, that was by November, and they had started in September. And then, all of a sudden, organically, by the Spirit, prayer meetings started popping up all over New York City. Hundreds of people began professing their faith in Jesus Christ. It went viral. The Spirit just leaped on other cities like Cleveland and Pittsburgh and St. Louis and Chicago. And in those cities in 1857, what you saw was there were five to 10,000 businessmen meeting during their lunch hour Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, saying, God, take our city. God, come down. God, own our town like Athens. And it was so strong, and it was such a move of God like we want to see in Athens. Now, get this. I've got a newspaper article that was written in, on March 20th. This is six months after the prayer meeting started in New York City. Just only six months. There is an article that appeared in, in of all the places, the New York Times. <laughs> here's, here's, what this, here's what this writer said. The great waves of religious excitement, which are now sweeping over this nation, is one of the most remarkable movements since the Reformation, going back hundreds of years. He writes, travelers relate that in cars and in steamboats, in, bar, in banks and in markets, Everywhere throughout this city, people are just absorbed with this topic of praying to God. Churches are crowded. Schools are turned into chapels. In New York City. <laughs> Do it again, God, right? Do it again. Yeah, converts are numbered by the scores of thousands. The writer continues, in this city, we have seen a sight which not even the most um, religious person could ever hope to see. We have seen in the business sections of our city during the busiest hours 
merchants assembling together along with clerks and working men to the number of 5,000 gathered day after day for worship. He must have blown this writer's mind. And then he continues, It is most impressive to think that over this great land of America, tens and fifties of thousands of men and women are putting themselves at this time in a serious way to ask the greatest question that the human mind can ever consider. What shall we do to be saved from sin? That's the power of the Holy Spirit gripping people. God did it in New York City. God's going to do it in Athens. Give yourself to this call. Wholly, completely. Don't hold back. Live to see. An unmistakable move of God, friends, is why you're alive now. Transforming this town of Athens through redemption, through restoration, through reconciliation, through revival. Would you join me and say, do it again, Jesus? Okay, now that wasn't enthusiastic enough. Do it again, Jesus. Okay, good. All right, he heard that prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, we worship you. We thank you. And Jesus, we're yours. This church belongs to you. I thank you, God. Just land now. Just bless each person who is here. Take a key from heaven. Unlock, God, our spirits. And Lord, just begin this restoration in us. And Lord, drop revival into our lives. Why not now? Why not here? Why not us? In Christ, it will be done. Amen.